Hello, my name is Ashley and this is Faith Rattos. Welcome or welcome back. So welcome back to the Rat Varieties and Genetics series here on my channel. This is one of my favourite types of video to film because I really am interested in it. Um, one of the reasons why I am on the Judges Training Programme with the NFRS, I actually had finished my, my stewarding allotment section so I'm now moving on to the next step which is really exciting um, but yeah I really enjoy rat varieties and genetics and that's why I make the videos on it and I hope it comes across just how much I like just love it um, at the show that I went to this weekend there was somebody there who um, just kept asking me questions and it made me think um, and it was just such a great conversation so if you are that person thanks very much it was a really great um, conversation um, so in today's video we're going to be talking about incomplete dominance now this is a really interesting thing and I'm just going to recap um, what a dominant is in case you don't know and then we'll get into it. So most animals, I'm going to say, it's not true for every sort of species on the planet. I was actually corrected on the video um, in the past about that. Most animals are passed one copy of each gene from each parent and that means that um, the baby will get two copies um, and they can either be dominant or, recess or recessive. Recessive needs to have two copies to show and dominant only needs one the hence why it's called dominant and it will and when i say to show it means to be expressed in the phenotype and phenotype is just a fancy word in to see like what the animal looks like so for example a is the is a dominant gene you only need one copy of it for it to express you only need one copy to be an agouti based rat however you can have two copies and that will also produce the same effect now this is where the incomplete dominant comes in so an incomplete dominant will have a different effect when there's two copies versus when there's one and the three most common i guess or the three that i am the most aware of there may be more I'm not sure, but the three that I'm most aware of are the Burmese gene, the Rex gene, the dominant Rex gene, and the Tonkinese gene. So, if we think about, we'll start with Rex. There is a type of recessive Rex, but it's not as common. So generally, all the Rex rats you see will be made using this dominant Rex gene. So, you only need to be passed one copy of the Rex gene from either parent to be Rex. That's why a pairing of Rex to standard coat will also produce a bunch of Rex and a bunch of standard coats. Now, if you have two copies of the Rex gene, you can be what is called a double Rex. Or you will be, if you've got two copies, you will be a double Rex. And this will happen if both of your parents were bred together and they were both Rexes and they both passed on the Rex gene to you. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, the Rex gene makes curly looking rats. It's a bit like Texels in um, mice and it's not like rex in rabbits because they don't have curly fur so rex in rats is the curly fur when it comes to a double rex a rat that has two copies of this rex gene they can become a bit patchy they can be from patchy to short coated like really short coated like peach fuzz to kind of completely hairless and so because of that it's not something that people are breeding for. They can use um, double Rex pairings or a Rex to Rex pairing to help out the Rex coat. However, it's not something that good breeders, in my opinion, are breeding for. They're not breeding for double Rex. They may come out um, and they probably will be fine. They probably won't have any more issues than any other rat. However, if they're as hairless as possible, being hairless opens up the skin to be prone to injuries and scratching and things like that, which does lead to a higher um, likelihood of abscesses and, and other nasty things that you don't really want to deal with. And I have gone into um, why the hairless rats are not ethical in a couple of other videos, but I may make a video solely on the unethical varieties in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so the double rex um, rat will have sparser hair, can be bald or can have like a peach fuzz. And I'm going to try and get some pictures of these rats so I can show you. The next gene is the Vermeer's gene. So the Vermeer gene um, works on the sea locus once the sea locus has been turned on. And what I mean by that is the off version of sea locus is dominant. 
so you need recessive genes there to turn it on but to turn it on you can either use this the lowercase c gene which is the um, albino gene or the ch gene which is the himalayan gene or the gene that brings in acromelanism which is a really fancy word for what happens for the pointed variety so if you think about siamese or burmese as well that shading and the points is due to acromelanism acromelanism is a um, really cool thing basically albinism is when the pigment is turned off acromelanism is when the pigment is turned off at a certain temperature once it gets to a certain temperature and it's too hot the protein of the pigment denatures and it turns white so in the colder, colder parts of the body the nose the ears the feet the hands and the tail and then uh, the back the rump those parts are colder and so they are darker and that's what makes the points and the shading on those types of rats so the Burmese has to have that turned on first. The Burmese gene can be carried. It's still dominant, but it won't express unless the sea locus is turned on. When the sea locus is turned on, the Burmese gene can sort of like come to the forefront. It needs its friend to show. And um, one copy of a Burmese looks like this, and it's called Burmese, and the Agouti version is called Wheaton. And then when it's got two copies of the Burmese gene. You get a sable and it looks like this. And so you can see the difference. The sable is much darker. The, I think the Burmese might be described as like chocolate or sandy. I know the Wheaton is definitely described as sandy, but the sable Burmese is described as an otter brown. It's a really lovely variety, not really my favorite. Burmese and Wheaton, that's a, that's a special place in my heart. I'm waiting for foundations to breed that. So that's really um, exciting. Things are in the works. So yeah, Burmese is my thing. Um, and so you can see two copies of the Burmese gene will make the rat darker. It still has points. They're a little bit harder to tell just because of how dark the rat is, but they still have points. Um, and yeah, those are the two um, ways you can find a Burmese. And another incomplete dominant um, that is actually kind of similar at least from what I can tell, to the Burmese gene is the Tonkinese gene. Now, the Tonkinese gene is called some different things in different countries. So the effect of the Tonkinese gene can be called different things in different countries. For example, I know some places call it Sable Siamese, which it's not. So the Tonkinese works in the same way. The C locus has to be turned on, has to be, you know, showing. So you either have to be on like an albino or um siamese base and the tonkinese gene does a similar type of thing to burmese it does look slightly different and it still obviously has those features of the acromelanism because of the seed locus being turned on and um, but it has a different effect it's doubled effect is works similarly to the tong it's double effect works similarly to the burmese so we haven't really come up with names because it's still being standardised here in the UK, but uh, two copies of the Tonk gene, or homozygous, which means the same, um, Tonk, has a darker effect than the heterozygous, one copy of Tonk, um, Tonk. And it's really interesting to see it's being worked on. Um, I'm actually possibly going to be getting some Tonkinese just as pets soon, um, which is really exciting. But yeah. Those are the three sort of, I don't know whether to say they're the most common, but they're the ones that I am the most aware of. Rex, Burma and Tonk. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions in the comments about anything that I've said today, please, please let me know. I'll try my best to answer them. Please keep in mind also that I'm here based in the UK, if you couldn't tell from my accent. So my um, perspective, I guess, is based on that and I think in different countries different things are sometimes believed but also different genes are available and people breed in a different way in different countries so keep that in mind I am UK based so don't let that sort of confuse you so thank you very much for watching this video um, I'm really really grateful you stuck around and yeah I'll see you in the next video Bye.